Welcome to the Peter King Podcast. And we're going to have a different podcast today as we record this podcast on Tuesday, October 12, the huge news of John Gruden and the Raiders divorcing on Monday night, ironically, in the middle of a Monday night football game, uh, is still fresh. And we're going to explore that in large detail on this podcast. It's going to be an, an unusual podcast. Um, and later on in the podcast, I'm going to have on Andrew Beaton of the Wall Street Journal, who started the ball rolling on Friday with his reporting uh, on this story. Um, I'll also discuss uh, the events of Monday night about Gruden uh, with Paul Burmeister of NBC Sports, and we will get into a little bit of football, but this podcast is going to be driven by the news about John Gruden. And I want to start by saying that the podcast this week is going to have some words I've never used in a podcast. Uh, there's going to be offensive language, which I'm using because a famous NFL coach, John Gruden, used this language, and this language is what ended up getting him either fired or getting him to resign uh, from the Las Vegas Raiders on Monday night. I just think they're necessary to explain why exactly John Gruden is out of work today. So the Raiders and Gruden, as I said, got divorced Monday night. Ironically, as I said, in the middle of a Monday night football game, uh, and this whole story started with the Wall Street Journal's reporting on Friday that from a, a collection of 650,000 emails that the NFL had collected in conjunction with its investigation of the Washington football team, several emails, offensive ones, were found uh, with Gruden in them and uh, uh, sent by uh, the Las Vegas Raiders coach. Now, understand this. At the time that he sent these emails, most of the time, if not all of the time, John Gruden was not an employee of the NFL. He was an employee of ESPN. He was doing the Monday night football games on television. And so these emails came before he was hired in early 2018. So there was a lot of discussion about whether these emails should constitute a reason for any sort of discipline because he wasn't a league employee at the time. But the NFL sent all of these emails um, in, in conjunction with this story to Raiders owner Mark Davis on Friday. And the journal started this uh, when there was an email sent from Gruden to uh, Bruce Allen, who at the time was the president of the Washington franchise, calling NFLPA executive director D. Smith, uh, who is black, saying that he had lips the size of Michelin tires. Uh, ESPN reported more offensive emails with Gruden in them and sent by Gruden were sent to uh, the Raiders owner, Mark Davis. They reported this on Friday, or that they were sent on Friday, and yet Davis did nothing over the weekend. And uh, 36 hours after, at least 36 hours after receiving the emails, John Gruden coached his final game, a loss to the Chicago Bears. And on Monday, um, the, the rest of the emails, or at least uh, a good deal of them, were revealed by the New York Times. The Times said that uh, he had called Roger Goodell, and I quote, a f end quote, and also called him a, quote, clueless anti-football end quote. And there was a lot more that the Times reported. He said that uh, Gruden was very critical of the league's efforts to get openly gay. College player Michael Sam drafted was very critical of the players protesting, taking knees on the sidelines in the wake of the Colin Kaepernick activism. And so there was a collection of these emails that Mark Davis then on Monday went to his office, looked for John Gruden, and Monday late afternoon they decided... West Coast time, they decided that Gruden would no longer continue as the coach of the Las Vegas Raiders. So that 
is the basis of what all has happened. And that is what we are looking at today. And the Raiders, obviously, one of the surprise teams in the first month of, a se- of the season, at least until a, a, a terrible performance on Sunday in a, in a home loss to Chicago. They had been one of the surprise teams of the early uh, weeks of the league, and now their season is in shambles. They will be coached on an interim basis by Rich Bisaccia. But this is not a story about the Oakland Raiders team on the field. Uh, Oakland Raiders, Las Vegas Raiders team on the field. It's a story about uh, their former head coach off the field. And that is a summary of it. I'm going to bring in Paul Burmeister now. We'll have a discussion about what it all means. Uh, And Paul, I I guess I'll start just by saying, when you heard the news Monday night, what were your initial thoughts? Initial thoughts were there there was no other way. Uh, This was the only outcome that could have happened, whether it was a resignation or a firing. However, it actually went down. It went from a situation over the weekend, Peter, that was uh, disturbing and offensive and certainly worth keeping an eye on to in a matter of moments Monday, as we all got into the details and in, in the words and the, the consistency with the behavior and the feeling that there was no other outcome. It was sudden, yeah, but it was, I think, more inevitable than it was sudden. You know, and I think the other part of this, Paul, is that, you know, Booger McFarland, I thought it made a great point on the Monday Night Football telecast, and that is that the NFL has all of these slogans that they put on helmets and put in end zones and racism, um, you know, among them and has been very, very pro um, inclusion uh, with the LGBTQ co- uh, community um, welcomed Carl Nassib with open arms when his announcement was made in the off season. Um, and, and, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, for those who are saying, oh, these are emails sent years ago, and really there aren't many saying that today. These are emails sent years ago. The league has been on a path right now, and this path has, in essence, been to, uh, you know, to make the game more inclusive and to make it not be a, a stigma if you're a football fan and you're gay. And, you know, look, Paul, I have a gay daughter She's a huge Pittsburgh Steelers fan. And I can tell you that, uh, you know, for for all of the discussion out there about, you know, what all of this means, I I really thought of my daughter Monday night um, and, and on Friday when I was hearing and reading about all of these things and just saying that, can you imagine if either the league did nothing or Mark Davis did nothing about this and you know he paid a fine or or did whatever i mean you know i think the people in the united states whatever the eight or nine percent whatever the number is in the united states of you know of people who are homosexual um many of whom absolutely love the nfl i just i just kept thinking there will be a mass exodus of those fans, and I can tell you, including my daughter, um, who would who'd walk away from the NFL. So there's so many little tributaries. But Paul, I want to ask you specifically one question just about players, and 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 I ask you this because you were a player in the Big Ten. You played quarterback at Iowa. You were in the Minnesota Vikings training camp. You understand what the locker room is like. And I wonder today, in today's day and age, how difficult do you think it would have been for John Gruden to walk back into his own locker room this week? I don't think it would have been accepted uh, because my, my feeling is, as you mentioned, as the way locker rooms are now and with the way people are thinking and feeling now, which is uh, 100% the right way, is that uh, it wouldn't have been okay. I I think every single player in that locker room is somewhere between, at the very least, they understand the outcome. And I would like to think that the the vast majority are past that and they fully support the outcome. So it it was the only way um, for the league, for the organization, and for the locker room, 
I don't think there would have been any players supporting him coming back, but the overwhelming majority would not have been okay with it. And it just, it's, it's hard to picture the option, Peter, isn't it? After those words, after we all read those words, it's hard to imagine him coming back and addressing the team uh, because if it wasn't the overwhelming majority, it would have been all the players who wouldn't have been okay with that. You know, Paul, um, I'm going to have further discussion, as I said, uh, in a few minutes on the podcast with Andrew Beaton of the Wall Street Journal. But I'll, I'll just, I'll finish this part, you know, the, the sort of non-football, but a big effect on football part of the part of our discussion today with making this point that uh, on Tuesday morning, somebody asked me on Twitter, um, you think that there's any chance that Gruden would get a college job? And I responded, and look, I used to be very, very active on Twitter. I am much less so these days because Twitter basically is a can't win place. Um, and, and, and this, and this person who, who asked you, you think you get a college job? I wrote and I said, would you send your child to play for him? And I don't know, before we recorded, I just looked at a lot of the mentions and I'd say 20 or 30% of the people said some version of yes, absolutely. I would. Um, so that's really the country we live in. We live in a divided country. We live in a country where a lot of people are going to say John Gruden didn't do anything wrong or he did very little wrong. But in this environment today, it's not, this is not a cancel culture move by the Las Vegas Raiders and by owner Mark Davis. This is a move of inevitability. There was no other decision that could have been made. And anyone who says otherwise, I think, is fooling himself because in essence, you have to be able to coach a diverse group of people. The NFL is majority black today. And it's pretty hard to walk into a locker room and to coach a team of players who are majority black when you are on the record as making the kind of racist statements and the uh, anti-gay statements, it, all the statements he made, it just would have been very hard to come back in. And, and Paul, I guess I'll, I'll just end with this, that John Gruden is going to go down in history as um, basically as, as really a controversial person, obviously. But I wonder if history, when judging him as a coach, will judge him as a better coach than he really was. Because in his career, John Gruden was 60 and 57 as a coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, won a Super Bowl there, obviously, but was three games over 500 in the regular season with the Bucs. And then was 62 and 59 with the Raiders three games over 500 with the Raiders in his last three full seasons, never brought the Raiders to the playoffs after being signed to a $100 million contract. So, and again, this is the ninth story on a day like this. But the fact is, I think we ought to realize that this is a huge, huge story. But Gruden was a little bit of a creation of the media, of an invention of the media. And I get to work at 317 a.m. I'm, you know, and all this. And I just, I now look at sort of the myths sometimes that we make and say, John Gruden was an okay football coach, but he was not a $100 million football coach. And a lot of people got sort of enthralled by the aura of Gruden, the charisma of Gruden. The, the TV personality that was Gruden. I don't know. And I, I throw this out to you as, as somebody who loves football, who watches football. What did you think of Gruden strictly as a football coach? As I sit here and listen to you talk about him and, and describe him prior to all this came out, I mean, the, the John Gruden we knew that we thought we knew, you know, prior to the last 72 hours, 
my mind goes back, Peter, to when I was in local news uh, at, at an NBC affiliate in Eastern Iowa. I was the weekend sports anchor. And on Sunday evenings, we would always show the Bears highlights, the Packers highlights, the Vikings highlights because of where we were located in, in the country. We made an exception to show Raiders highlights from 2001 to two and three, not because they were really good and they were really good, but because of seeing John Gruden on the sidelines. People enjoyed it. The, the Chucky faces, the energy, the charisma. It became part of what we were doing in covering the NFL in three minutes, in addition to the local teams, because of John Gruden. And whether you want to call it likability or energy or charisma, it was all there. And the nation was kind of captivated by it. And then he won the Super Bowl, as you mentioned, and then not nearly as much success uh, recently. Um, but that all started a while ago, not because they were winning, but because of who he was on the sideline. And I think we all remember that maybe even a little too much. And you mentioned the record of 62 and 59. Even if that was 82 and 39, if my math is correct there, I think it would be tremendously overshadowed, not only right now, uh, but in the long run, as people look back and evaluate them. I, you know, <laughs> I think of, you know, because obviously John Gruden took over a very good team in Tampa and he, and he took it to, uh, to win a Super Bowl. So I think of that and I think of George Seifert, who took over a great team and won with the 49ers for a while. And I just think to myself, Poor George Seifert living his post-football life, or maybe fortunate George Seifert living his football life in absolute anonymity uh, and, and uh, you know, has a better career record than John Gruden, but that's, uh, that's America today. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.